News of the Times. Wicked Wednesdays. The Victorian sex cult of the Agapmonites. Part 1. Welcome to News of the Times Wicked Wednesdays, where we look at events and organisations that were making the headlines of their day. In today's episode, we are looking at the Agapmonites, regarded as a sex cult in the Victorian times. It was started in 1846 and closed down in 1956. Like most cults, it was dependent on a dynamic leader. The Agapmonites featured two consecutive leaders and the infamous Knotted Sisters with their hefty inheritance, which gave the cult the financial backing it needed to exist in the splendour it obtained. The story is fascinating, but convoluted, and went through two distinct storylines. The founder of the cult, Henry James Prince, and the successor, John Smythe Piggott. Both leaderships were filled with scandal and drama. In today's episode, we focus on the founding of the Agapamon, with the first leader and the stories surrounding the Nettage sisters. We hope you enjoy the show. About the Agapmonites. The Agapmonites were a religious group that emerged in the 19th century in England. Founded in 1864 by Henry James Prince, who later adopted the name Prince Hermann von Pucker Muscal. The Agapmonites believed in the concept of spiritual marriage and claimed to have divine authority. The name Agapmonites derives from the Greek word agapemon, meaning abode of love. The organization was referred to in the papers as a sex cult, with what would be regarded in this day as open relationships, which would not necessarily require a formal religious ceremony. Instead, the organization stated that men had spiritual wives. Henry James Prince, later known as Prince Hermann von Puckler Moscow, also Brother Prince. Prince, as we will refer to him in this episode, founded his religious order of the Agapmonites in 1864. Henry James Prince, or Brother Prince, was born at Bath in 1811 and educated for the medical profession, but in 1835 his health broke down and he became a theological student at Lampeter College. After his ordination and marriage, he obtained a curacy at Charlinch in Somerset. Prince was a follower of the religious ideas of the German mystic Terstegen concerning the absorption of the saved believer in the personality of the Supreme Being, and gradually came to regard himself as a visible embodiment of the Divine Spirit. Prince, with his rector, Starkey, would set up a new church, ostensibly under the umbrella of the Church of England, begin to preach their version which entailed Prince as a living embodiment of Christ, or the Comforter, as promised by Christ, lose his license, became defrocked, and try again. Prince eventually landed in Weymouth with his revivalist type of preaching. Prince and his rector Starkey drew in converts. From the Newcastle Chronicle, the second of July, eighteen eighty-seven, the Agapemon, eighteen sixty-seven. Craftsmen sold their tools, grocers their stock, farmers their land, to throw their possessions into a common fund. Those who could do no more bought in a basket of eggs, pail of milk, and a cartload of straw. 
the chosen met together in the fashion of the ancient agape, to eat and drink, to sing and pray, to look for signs and wonders, and to rejoice as one family in the Lord. The world was near its end. The chosen were to live henceforth as one body of saints, to live as brothers and sisters, cherubs and seraphs, united in the Son of Man. Old relations of blood and wedlock were to be either dissolved or changed. Love was to be continued and increased, for God is love. But courtship was to be an exercise of the soul, while wedlock was to shed its old relations with the carnal man. Those who were single were to keep so. Those who were married were to live as though they were not. Money came in thick and fast, for there were many rich spinsters among the converted, and Prince became the banker and trustee of the saved. We know, said Prince, that the day of grace is past, and that the day of judgment is at hand. The old world is no more. God has withdrawn from it his own. We live here in the Lord. We neither marry nor give in marriage. Those who married in the world live here as though they had not. Men house apart from women and know no craving after. The Agapmanites' belief system. Prince taught that the end of the world was near and that he was one with God and represented God. For our regular listeners, the belief of the end of the world and himself as leader being a living embodiment of God is not that dissimilar to the girling episode from our eccentric Sunday series. The main difference between them being that Girling insisted on complete celibacy, whereas Prince firmly believed in open relationships and that sex helped to come closer to God. In a kind of merge of standard Christianity and the borrowing heavily from German mystic Ter Stegen, the dogma of the organization followed these basic tenets. Divine Authority the Agapmonites claimed to have divine authority and believed that their founder, Prince Hermann von Puckler Muskau, as he later called himself, was the Messiah, or a special emissary of God. Spiritual marriage. The concept of spiritual marriage was central to Agapmonite theology. They believed that by entering into a spiritual union with Prince Hermann or other chosen leaders, Followers could attain salvation and experience a higher level of spiritual enlightenment. This spiritual marriage entailed several illegitimate children, so it was clearly not strictly spiritual in nature. Gender Equality The Agapmonites emphasized the importance of women in their religious community. They believed that women held a special spiritual status, and had the power to guide men towards salvation. As a result, women played prominent roles within the group and had equal standing with men. Charismatic Worship The Agapmonites engaged in charismatic forms of worship, characterized by ecstatic experiences, speaking in tongues, and other spiritual manifestations. They believed in the presence of the Holy Spirit and the ability to communicate directly with God. Prince encouraged followers to make significant financial contributions to the Agapmonite community, which would then be controlled by Prince. As we will see, this led to concerned families' legal entanglements and accusations of financial exploitation and manipulation. 
The Agapmonites practiced communal living, residing together in their headquarters, the luxurious Agapmon mansion in Spraxton, Somerset, a few miles from Bridgewater, which was eventually built through the resources of the Nottish sisters. The Agapmonites shared resources and lived according to their communal principles. However, there did seem to be a distinction between the workers, those whose contribution was not large, versus those whose financial contribution was substantial. Hence, there was a layered class system within the community. The Knotted Sisters The Knotted children, seven girls and four boys, grew up in Wixow in Suffolk during the late 18th and early 19th century. The family were prosperous wool clothiers with mills in Bocking and Wixow in Suffolk. Religious instruction was a keystone to the children's upbringing, and the children were strongly encouraged to spend much time reading religious texts and to attend church regularly. Startling Revelations The Nottage Sisters and the Enigmatic Agapamon. In the quiet hamlet of Stoke near Wixow, a family ensnared by a fervent religious fervour find themselves entangled in the clutches of an enigmatic preacher. The Nottage sisters, five unmarried daughters of the late Josia Nottage, are at the centre of this captivating tale. It all began in the year 1843 when the Reverend Henry Prince, known for his peculiar possessed-like behaviour during sermons, delivered his impassioned rhetoric at a local church. Little did the sisters know that their lives would soon be forever altered by this charismatic creature. Tragedy struck the Nottage family the following year with the passing of their father. In a twist of fate, each of the five sisters inherited a considerable sum of £6,000. Seizing upon this opportunity, Prince cunningly persuaded the sisters to invest their newfound wealth in the creation of a religious community, and so the Agapemon, also known as the Abode of Love, was born in the idyllic lands of Somerset. Prince, a master manipulator, preyed upon affluent unmarried women, and the Nottage sisters were no exception. He took multiple spiritual wives from his devoted congregation, blurring the lines between spirituality and personal gain. In a ceremony that sent shockwaves through society, three of the sisters were married off the prince's close disciples in a joint union in Swansea in 1845. Yet amidst the mesmerising allure of Prince's teachings, a glimmer of doubt emerged. One of the younger sisters began to question the true nature of their new existence. Unfortunately, her warnings went unheeded. Louisa Nottage, still unwed at the age of 44, decided to embark on a journey to Somerset to join the Agapemont in late 1846. Five of the Nottage unmarried daughters were each given an inheritance of £6,000 upon the death of their father. Harriet, Agnes and Clara, with their £6,000 inheritance worth nearly a million pounds each in 2023, inspired by the revivalist teachings of Prince, were convinced to join the Agapmonites, marrying three of Prince's Agapamon clergymen and handing over the sum of £18,000 to Prince. It would seem that Clara and Harriet lived happily in the abode of love with their spiritual husbands, although Agnes eventually left the cult with a child. Louisa Nottage, The Intervention and the Insane Asylum Louisa Nottage wished to follow her sisters, despite warnings from Agatha who was beginning to recognise that all was not as it seemed in her new life. Louisa Nottage, still a spinster at the age of 44, travelled to Somerset to join the community late in 1846. Prince welcomed the latest member of the Nottage sisters along with her £6,000 warmly. 
Their mother, Emily Nottage, concerned with the spiritual and financial influence that the Reverend Prince held over her now four daughters, enlisted the help of her eldest surviving son, Edmund, her nephew and her son-in-law, to travel to Somerset and rescue Louisa. The Abduction of Louisa in November 1864, locals of the Lambs Inn, located next door to the abode of love, heard frantic screaming coming from within the walls of the Spaxton Retreat. The three men had managed to scale the walls and remove Louisa, much against her will, from Agapemont. The Lambs Inn visitors saw Louisa still screaming being bundled into a waiting coach which quickly ran off. Louisa's continued insistence regarding the divinity of Prince and her refusal to leave the Agapemon led to Louise's mother incarcerating her daughter in Moorcroft Insane Asylum. Notes on her mental condition were recorded in the Lancet. Louisa maintained her conviction throughout that Prince was the salvation, that God would eventually save her, and all those within the asylum would be all judged in the fast-approaching Armageddon. Louisa managed to escape the asylum in January 1848, some 18 months after her forced incarceration. Word reached Prince that she was hiding in a hotel in Cavendish Square in London. The Reverend William Cobb, one of Louisa's brother-in-laws from the Agapemont, was dispatched to collect Louisa and bring her back to the abode of love, Agapemont in Saxton. However, officials from the asylum were also scouring London for Louisa. Louisa was found at Paddington Station where she had been waiting for the Reverend Cobb to collect her. She was taken away and locked up again. Prince and the Reverend Cobb made an immediate request for review from the commissioners of lunacy, who declared Louisa to be sane. Louisa was free. A lengthy court case ensued with Louisa suing her family for the illegal abduction and committal to an insane asylum. Louisa won, along with damages, and went back to the Agapemont where she transferred the whole of her remaining £6,000 to Prince. The Daring Rescue and Legal Battle of Louisa Nottage In a shocking turn of events, a mother's deep concern over the spiritual and financial control exerted by the charismatic Reverend Henry Prince upon her daughters has led to a bold and audacious intervention. Mrs. Emily Nottage, driven by her maternal instincts, devised a plan that involved nothing short of capture and kidnapping. With a heavy heart, Emily called upon her son Edmund, her nephew Edward Nottage, and her son-in-law Frederick Ripley to embark on a perilous mission to Somerset. Their objective, to liberate Louisa, one of Emily's daughters, from the clutches of Prince and his mysterious Agapimon. Against considerable odds, the valiant trio succeeded in rescuing Louisa, but not without resistance. In November 1846, they whisked her away against her will, and she was subsequently confined within the confines of Ripley's Villa, situated in the esteemed Regent's Park. Alarming claims made by Louisa regarding Prince's divine nature left her mother no choice but to have her declared insane. Consequently, Louisa was consigned to the gloomy Moorcroft House Asylum. However, in a daring escape from her asylum confinement in January 1848, she sought refuge with Reverend William Cobb, a trusted confidant from the Agapemont community. Their fleeting encounter was short-lived, as two days later, Louisa was recaptured at Paddington Station. Cobb promptly alerted the commissioners in lunacy, prompting an investigation that ultimately led to Louise's release in May 1848. Seizing the opportunity to seek justice and retribution, Louisa took legal action against her own flesh and blood. She sued her brother, her cousin, and brother-in-law for the grave offences of abduction and false imprisonment. 
In a stunning victory, Louisa emerged triumphant, proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that she had been unlawfully detained. The court awarded her damages, thus vindicating her harrowing experience. After the courtroom triumph, Louisa made a fateful decision, transferring her wealth into Prince's hands. She returned to the embrace of the Agapemon community, where she would live until her untimely demise in 1858. The story of Louise Nottage incarceration into an insane asylum to escape the clutches of the Victorian sex cult leader, as expected, made the headlines and was the inspiration of Wilkie Collins' story, The Woman in White. Charles Dickens opinioned on the forceful abduction and incarceration, and it was a case that helped to reshape the insanity laws over time. The Abode of Love with the web of scandals that enshrouded the Agapemon, the cult grew from a modest 60 to an impressive 200 in just a few short years. No one within the community received any money for their devotion to Prince. Whilst Prince luxuriated in the comforts of the main house, surrounded by a bevy of alluring women, his so-called saints, toiled in the fields and gardens confined to meagre cottages, with husbands separated from wives. The prevailing atmosphere brooked no dissent, with Prince's word taken as absolute truth, just as the word of God was deemed unquestionable. Prince reveled in his newfound power, indulging in sumptuous feasts and imbibing fine wines. Having long abandoned his period of total abstinence, Above all, he relished his absolute authority over the throngs who worshipped him as a deity. Life within the Agapemon assumed a heavenly facade, with desires sated and passions embraced. Amidst this spectacle, certain women emerged as objects of desire, their allure undeniable. Within this small, isolated community, Prince began to believe in his own infallibility and presumed that he could act with impunity. He claimed the status of the Holy Ghost, asserting his duty to bring heavenly love to earth, even if it meant violating the sanctity of virgins. Prince would later publish intricate theological justifications for his acts of violating a young virgin before his gathered congregation. One example given is the public deflowering of a 16-year-old Zoe Patterson. The event took place within the chapel with the congregation surrounding Prince and Zoe to the sounds of organ music. According to Prince himself, thus the Holy Ghost took flesh in the presence of those whom he had called as flesh. He took this flesh absolutely in his sovereign will and with the power and authority of God. The child, born nine months later, was referred to by Prince as the devil child. He had told his congregation that as God he could not impregnate, only purify. Within the Agapemont community, the event became a scandal, and several followers with their money left. The short-term impact of the famous case was to put the Agapemonites into retreat. Prince himself seemed to have gone into hiding. Stories of debauchery and sexual initiation rites associated with virgins were told from those who had left with an accompanying impact on the fortunes of those remaining. From the West Somerset Free Press, the 30th of January, 1886, Sprexton. The inhabitants of the Spraxton Agapemon, made famous by one of the most sensational and graphic of the chapters Bepworth Dixon's Spiritual Wives, are just now few in number and much reduced in circumstances. Brother Prince, the founder of this Somersetshire abode of love, no longer derives into Bridgewater in an open barouche drawn by four horses with postillions, to say nothing of attendant outriders and bloodhounds. 
He, in fact, is himself never seen outside the wall at all, but his cleanly shaven followers still have to pay occasional visits to the shops by their nearest town, and when they do, they drive there in a modest dog cart or an unassuming stanhope. The glory of the Agapemon has departed since the riches of its inmates have withdrawn with all that was left of their fortune. Having seen the place in the very heyday of its prosperity, I found a marked change in its appearance when I revisited it last week. The so-called chapel has still a billiard table and a large automatic barrel organ for its principal fittings, but the red velvet and springs of the once luxurious couches are and divans are worn, and the organ is distinctly out of tone. The stable, in which forty horses were once kept in a well-nigh royal state, are to a great extent empty. The grounds once so neatly kept show the general neglect. From what I could gather from local gossips, the few remaining faithful disciples who declare that Brother Prince still lives are correct in their assertion. They qualify their declaration stating that he has died in the flesh and is now living in the spirit only. But I need scarcely say that everyone outside the high walls of the abode of love believes Brother Prince must be of a goodly age. Unless his adherents contrive to smuggle him away, his actual death cannot be much longer delayed. Two years after the death of Louisa in 1858, Ralph Nottage, Louisa's brother and will executor, sued Prince to recover the money that Prince had been given by Louisa, the grounds that Prince had had an undue influence over her. The case of Nottage v. Prince in 1860 once again hit the headlines and was heavily reported in the Times. The event having to do with money went through the Chancery. The argument was that although Louisa had proven at the time that she was sane and could act as her own guardian, she had been unduly influenced by Prince's claims of his own divinity. In essence, his claims of being the Messiah constituted fraud and influenced her already weak mind. From the Times, the 9th of October, 1860, the Agapemon again. The founder of the Agapemon will, we are happy to say, be compelled to surrender a portion of his ill-gotten gains. Vice-Chancellor Stewart gave judgment yesterday in the case of Nottage v. Prince, declaring that the transfer of stock belonging to the late Louisa Jane Nottage into the name of the defendant was improperly obtained, and it must be set aside. That the stock must be transferred to the legal personal representative of Miss Louisa Nottage, and all the dividends accrued since her death must be paid to the plaintiff, and the defendant must pay the costs of the suit. It is not too much to say that a judgment which would have left Prince in possession of the fruits of his blasphemous imposture would have been an encouragement to the vilest kind of men to prey on the weakest kind of women. It is unnecessary for us to repeat a tale so many times told as that of the Agapemon. Mr. Prince had been a long time before the public, who know all about the abode of love, the gardens, the closed gates, the bloodhounds, the carriages and four, the hockey, and the three unfortunate sisters who believed in the divine mission of the founder. That he was deprived of his license by two different bishops, but made the acquaintance of the Nettages due during his second curacy, and after opening a chapel which he called the Cave of Adullam. He founded the Agapemon with the three sisters among his leading disciples. Two of them he married to two of his followers, and the third, Louisa Jane Nottage, on being released from a lunatic asylum on the grounds that her religious delusions were incurable and that a further confinement would injure her health, made over her whole fortune, consisting of £6,000, to Prince as a free gift, the only compensation she received being her board and lodging at the Agapemon until the time of her death in July 1858. 
The transfer has now been set aside by the Vice-Chancellor with costs against the defendant prince. As this sum is generally connected with some amount of education, the Agapemonites cannot hope for many converts. They have not been an aggressive church. But if they had desired the poor and had been able to ensure them by some material prosperity, they might have had Somersetshire's peasants by the hundreds. The new church and the death of Prince, with converts continuing to dwindle and the accompanying money that brought in. In 1896, at the ripe age of 85, Prince came out of his seclusion to open a new church. The new church required a new preacher. Enter Hugh Smith Piggott. We will take a look at the new church, the various scandals surrounding both the new church as well as their new leader, Smith Piggott, in the concluding episode of the Victorian sex cult of the Agapemonites at next Wicked Wednesday's episode. We hope to see you next week. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesday's The Victorian Sex Cult of the Agapemonites Part 1. We really hope you enjoyed the show. We would like to thank our tremendous supportive subscribers. Thank you. Your comments, suggestions and interaction is greatly appreciated. Thank you again. If you haven't subscribed, we would be very grateful if you did. We need a minimum of 1,000 subscribers to keep this channel alive. Please subscribe, tell your friends and share on social media. We would greatly appreciate it. We upload five days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. And Wednesdays will become Wicked Wednesdays, and in this series we will be looking at some of the shocking events, bloody places and outrageous organisations of their day. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News at the Times, and I am Robin Coles.